Well, welcome everyone and uh, thank you for joining us this afternoon. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which I'm speaking to you today, the Kamaragal people, and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. My name is Kelly Mitchell from the Historical Services team at Stanton Library. And today I have the pleasure of introducing North Sydney Council's historian, Dr. Ian Hoskins, for the latest in our online history talk series and also the last for 2022. Um, Boatyards and Bays, North Sydney's Working Waterfront. Um, the first of next year's talks will be um, on the 25th of January. Um, so please keep an eye on the website for further details about that and how you can book. Um, and if you've missed any of the previous talks, then the recordings are available to watch online. Um, just search our website for history talks to find those links. If you have any questions during the talk, then feel free to write them into the chat box and I will put them to Ian for a short Q&A session after his presentation. Um, and for any other general inquiries, requests for digital images and so on, then please email us at localhistory at northsydney.nsw.gov.au and we'll be very happy to help. Um, and now I'll uh, hand over to Ian for his presentation. Thanks, Ian. Oh, thank you, Kelly, and um, thanks everyone for uh, logging on and <laughs> joining us. This is a... Um, talk following on a joint presentation I gave with Rundy Svensson last month. Um, Rundy had written a history of Berries Bay. She'd also written a history of her um, uh, her family's involvement in boat building uh, in Sydney Harbour. She's part of the, the Halverson family and a book also on tugs. And we'd spoken for some time about um, her presenting um, about Berry's Bay because that book came out last year and it took a while to organize all that so we we only did it in the last month or so um, that was a in-house in Stanton presentation that wasn't recorded visually uh, so I thought I'd just uh, do my version of that talk of a few modifications which makes it a bit different if you did roll up and hear Randy and myself um, last month this will be slightly different but um, yeah, following on from that. And and also, um, if I can put in a plug, uh, in anticipation of, um, I'm, I'm thinking of Sydney Harbour because uh, there's a new edition of my History of Sydney Harbour coming out at the beginning of December. I'll be talking about that again in house at Stanton uh, next week on Wednesday. That's, I think, the 7th. So let, let's kick off. Um, and there's a the photograph I've chosen there, as you can see from the, caption is Woodleys, which I'll end up with Woodleys. Um, so there's a nice narr narrative arc. Uh, Woodleys is still <laughs> not in that form, but in a in a big iron um, structure, which you'll see at the end of the talk. Um, they're tucked away on the northwest corner of Berries Bay, a very important site. I love this photograph particularly because it shows the landscape behind and you can see the vestigial rocks and the um the scrub and the and the bush there it hasn't been changed so pretty well all of that was swept away in the 1920s and um quite a lot of it grown back but much thicker than you can see there okay um and a really good need to also acknowledge the um Camaragal people as kelly did and the fact that theirs was a, a working waterfront because they, from, from the descriptions of the early colonial journals, um, spent most of their time down near the water. Seafood was their main source of nutrition if what contention others are to be believed. Um, and they needed to move around by water and therefore use the, the Nawi, the bark canoes um, that you can see in the foreground of that French engraving uh, probably based on a a French drawing done at the turn of the 19th century even though this engraving I suspect is 1820s but it would show a um, a scene that would be very much a, a pre-contact pre-colonial scene um, the Bodan expedition was in in harbour in around 1801 and the French uh, made a lot of artwork there and I, I'm pretty sure this engraving is there and it's almost certainly of, of the North Shore somewhere because you can see how steep the waterfront is. 
it's a looks a little bit like Ball's Head and could conceivably be Ball's Head. Um, so this is the Aboriginal working waterfront. But the, it, it's important to remember that Aboriginal people, particularly around the harbour, were, um, well, hunting and gathering. Um, it doesn't mean they were nomads. They had a territory, the Gamma Ragal Territory was all the way from Woodford Bay, present day Lane Cove, to Cremorne and um, somewhere in the north, possibly as far as Taramara, but I suspect um, at least to Middle Harbour, um, that that bay there, that waterway presents an obvious boundary. Um, the Durham-Murrigal were the people of Taramara and they may have come down, their territory may have extended as far south as that. In any case, it's a big, it's a big area, 10 square kilometres or more, 15 square kilometres for 100 to 200 people. So they moved around in that area from bay to bay and um, rock shelter to rock shelter. The, the modern thinking, the modern anthropological thinking of hunter-gatherers is, is that it was a very sophisticated and good lifestyle, particularly for groups of 100 to 200 people. So it... it minimize the amount of um, time required for producing food, particularly if, if you had a reasonably large area. And that allowed a lot of time for cultural activities and leisure and sleeping. Um, so it's by no means uh, an inferior way of life to the, the the life of the agriculturalist or the merchant or the trader as, as was often thought, particularly in the early 20th century and perhaps the 19th century. So um, modern anthropology, contemporary anthropology, emphasizes the benefits of hunting and gathering. Um, so there's, yeah, so I'm, I'm pretty sure the Gamma Eagle people can adequately be described as hunters and gatherers moving around in their big territory, um, mainly fishing. And there you can see them cooking and fishing. Women in Canoes, men using spears by the foreshore, again, according to the early colonial accounts. Um, there's a, a small part of a, a really detailed, beautiful pencil sketch that's probably at least a metre long, maybe a metre and a half long, uh, drawn by Louisa Meredith, who wrote a book called uh, Notes. Oh, gee, I've got the title, something like an account of, of New South Wales. She she came to Sydney in 1839, was here 1839, 1840. Beautiful descriptions of life in Sydney at that time. And she was also depicting the, the waterway. This was done from Mrs Macquarie's chair. She ended up going down to Tasmania. That book is very available um, under the, under the um, name Mrs Charles Meredith. Um, is a penguin facsimile and she describes in that drawing the harbour and this is the drawing I when I was at the powerhouse museum as a curator there in the late 90s early um, 2000s I, I actually acquired this work for the powerhouse collection so know it fairly well um, and it it's looking out towards the north so therefore it shows the the um, the north shore foreshore with the with the forest coming right down to the foreshore pretty well un well absolutely undeveloped there are one or two houses over there in the around 1839 but very little else um so that's the that's the type of forest and the waterfront that Europeans set about shaping over the next 200 years um and that's essentially the story that I'm going to tell today that's Peeping around, as far as I can tell, it's a little hard to to work this out, even as you look at the the entire panorama. But I'm pretty sure we're peeping around Kirribilli into Careening Cove, and then further beyond um, Neutral Bay. And here is one of the earliest houses that wasn't shown in that drawing because it's out of out of sight around Kirribilli. There, uh, Thrupp's Cottage, photographed probably in the 1920s or 30s, shortly before it was demolished, that sat beside on the western side of Hay Street in Neutral Bay. Um, and Alfred Thrupp never lived there, but it's still called Thrupp's Cottage because that whole uh, expanse of modern day Neutral Bay was referred to as the Thrupp Estate. It was actually bought by John Piper 
around 1814 or thereabouts and supposedly given to his um, daughter and son-in-law, the Thrupps, who um, who left, who, who didn't take up <laughs> the offer essentially and, and left for Tasmania. Um, so the the land passed into the ownership of the Cooper family when uh, John Co when John Piper went bankrupt in 1827. But someone was living in this cottage on the foreshore in the 1820s and 30s. Whether that jetty dates back that far, I'm not sure. I suspect there was a jetty there as early as that. Um, and it, it's interesting to consider European versus um, Aboriginal modes of, um, of water transport. Aboriginal people could have a, a bark canoe just pulled up on the foreshore. They'd climb in, despite looking rather flimsy, they're actually very stable, again, according to the colonial accounts, and they'd head off. And they weren't, um, they were certainly not overdressed, so they're not burdened with, with great crinoline dresses and all the rest and suits, as were European um, people. To step into a, a, a rowing boat, certainly a, a pinnace or something like that, a larger boat with a with a sail, you need to step down into it. Therefore, you need a, a jetty and the boat is larger. It needs deeper water, hence also the need for a jetty. So um, they're all interesting things to consider. Aboriginal people, in other words, didn't need jetties and wharves. They simply pushed off from beaches, but Europeans did because of the nature of the, the watercraft they were using. There's um, There's that drawing again and I'm showing this because I want to emphasize Neutral Bay because Neutral Bay was the site of the first steam ferry built in Sydney Harbour at all. HG Smith was the, the shipwright and I have no images of his slip or his um, his works in Neutral Bay so I'm just showing you the next best thing. Uh, he, he built a ferry, a steam powered ferry called the Surprise, quite, quite aptly named, uh, and slipped it in 1831 and it chugged around Sydney Harbour for six months and then was um, taken under its own steam down to Tasmania where it served the population down there. So, so that's quite extraordinary that uh, a waterfront like the one you're looking at, covered in forest um, with no infrastructure, uh, was also the um, the site of the first steamboat. I mean, that that's quite extraordinary technology to be putting together. Um, on the foreshores of Neutral Bay. And I suspect the, the surprise looked a little bit like this ferry here, which I'm thinking is one called the Ferry Queen, already quite old by the time this photograph is taken in the late 1860s or 1870s. This is Blues Point, um, looking a little different than to Blues Point today, although that land there, that very flat land you can see behind the ferry is reclaimed foreshore. So uh, possibly where the lawn is today and there's a children's playground there. You can see the natural rock. And I particularly like this photograph because it also shows a retaining wall of, of um, ashlar or uh, sandstone blocks there. So there's a modified wa waterfront necessary again for the nature of the, the watercraft that are being used. But there's also a vestige of a beach. Um, there's certainly not that anymore at, at um, Lose point. And you can see two types of vessels pulled up there. One, one is a um, you know, fairly large rowing boat it, um, in the foreground there. And the other two are very shallow skiffs, both of which were used regularly to go back and forth over the harbour. Uh, people living on the north side have business on the south side. They're zipping back and forth before the um, establishment of really permanent or reg, sorry, regular ferry services. Um, Blues Point is named after Billy Blue, of course, who's known to many people as the first waterman or one of the early watermen on Sydney Harbour. And by virtue of his land grant there and his um, uh, ferry business, which was just essentially in rowing boats at the time, it also became the, the first uh, landing place for ferries going back and forth, but they weren't regular in the 1830s and 40s and 50s. It was not until 1861 that there was a regular ferry service going back and forth. And that was co-founded by the Milson family and probably for that reason, didn't um, land at 
Blues Point, although it may have stopped there, but the, it mainly travelled um, Dawes Point across to Milson's Point. And there's a um, a ferry not unlike the one you've just seen and probably, again, very similar to the surprise that Mr Smith built in Neutral Bay uh, in 1856. You can see how people are dressed there and they they would have been dressed in a similar way in the 1830s. And, and again, you can see the need for, for wharves stepping down into a boat. You're not going to be paddling in your ankles to, to climb into a, a rickety um, rowing boat, uh, if you're a gentleman or a gentlewoman. So boat ferries are heading to and from the, the uh, north and south side, and therefore they need infrastructure, they need wharves, uh, but they're also being built on the north side from at least the 1870s, possibly earlier. And uh, William Dunn is one of the first boat builders in Berries Bay. Berries Bay is the really the, the main boat building area, despite the, um, the first ferry being built in Neutral Bay. It's Berries Bay that William Dunn and others um, set up shop. And one of his most famous vessels, several, several famous uh, boats were built in Berries Bay, but one of the, the most significant is this uh, ferry boat, the Wallaby, designed by um, Norman Self. Uh, significant because it's a double ender. Um, unfortunately, the, the photograph is cut off there. You can't see the, um, the other end of it, but it's identical at both ends. Double ending ferry means that the, the captain having docked can go to the other end of the boat and the, the boat heads out the other way. It doesn't have to turn around from a wharf. So it's a it's quite a useful thing. You don't have to turn around. You don't need as much space. So there's a significant sophisticated boat being um, built in Berries Bay as early as 1879. There's uh, so William Dunn's yard was uh, closer to the the head of the bay. Um, where Noakes Boatyard is today. I'll talk about Noakes towards the end of this, this afternoon's talk. Uh, Ford's Boatyard, very well known, well respected, um, was shoo, about halfway along that eastern side of um, Berries Bay. And I love this plan because it shows you the slip works that are actually cut into the, cut into the land boats were built essentially on land and slipped into the water. Um, and again, you can see how, how much that uh, meant modifying the foreshore, like something Aboriginal people didn't have to do. They trod lightly on the earth because of their technology and the numbers in the various clans, but Europeans really did start modifying those landscapes to, to build boats, um, to land boats, to dock boats and to transport goods to and from um, the, the, for, the northern foreshore and the southern foreshore. This is a nice uh, letterhead for a rarely mentioned firm, Ineson Brothers. Uh, Ford's well known, Dunn's well known, Woodley's well known, but Ineson, I, I think they were there into the 1950s, don't quote me on that one but this um, is clearly dated 1916 ships chandlers so all the other the bits and pieces you need to to build boats they're providing there as well um just at the end of munro street very close to ford's yard therefore they would have been neighbors on the east side of berry's bay lavender bay is the other significant boat building um cove in in north sydney and here is uh, a view looking down towards the west. So we're, we're essentially not quite above the pool, a little north of the pool, looking over the Lavender Bay Baths, um, where there's a boardwalk essentially around that foreshore now. And several of those boat, those sheds you can see on the eastern side were active boat building yards. And there's one of them, Goddard's boat yard, tucked down into the head of the bay. Um, they built and serviced leisure craft as well, because the, the harbour by the end of the 19th century was full of working vessels, but it was also a, um, 
a leisure waterway, so there's plenty of uh, boat racing going on. And th there you can tell the, the they're very fast leisure vessels, they're not working vessels. Goddard's became the Neptune Engineering and Slipway Company. And here's a, uh, here's a vessel, you can see the name Tay on the side and the number what looks like 385. I don't think that's the name of the vessel Tay. I think that refers to the Tay Lighterage Company, which was based over at Balmain. And the core business for them is salvaging sunken vessels. And this, this looks like it's been underwater for a while. So it's been, my suspicion is that it's been um, towed over to uh, Neptune Engineering and Slipway Company in Lavender Bay and it's it's being salvaged and maybe it's been made um, seaworthy again. The Neptune Slipway Company was there until the 1980s. Terrible fire in the 1950s destroyed a lot of it, but it kicked on until the 1980s and it was demolished and replaced with a set of townhouses. If you can visualize Lavender Bay and the townhouses on the western side of the bay, that's where the, the slip where the engineering and slipway company was. And there's still the um, vestige of a, a slip there and a bit of a sandy beach. And the most famous, in my mind anyway, the, of the boat builders of Lavender Bay is Bob Gordon, who was there at the very end. He worked at the um, Neptune Engineering Company. And when they that um, establishment was demolished, Bob had nowhere else to build boats, but in the archway of the 1890s train viaduct there, and the slipway was no longer operational. So Bob built several beautiful yachts um, and they had to be taken out of the, the, the archways and, and essentially put in the water by crane. Um, but he was there until he died in 2008 or thereabouts. He was the last wooden boat builder of, of Lavender Bay. There's Bob actually working in Berries Bay. He, he obviously worked in Berries Bay as well, but was based in that archway for many years in Lavender Bay. So a real, um, a real identity of, of North Sydney. I remember before I started working at North Sydney, seeing Bob building boats in the archway in, in Lavender Bay in a, in a big um, white, uh, whiteboard there with with the title frequently asked questions so he'd answer the questions before you even asked them so you wouldn't disturb him while he was building his boat. Um, now working waterfronts mean more than just boat building I mean that's important but they were North Sydney had a heavily industrialized waterfront and this is a lovely watercolor of, uh, of the sugar works at Ball's Head Bay. Ball's Head Bay is west of Berries Bay. Few people, I suspect, know that there was a sugar works there. If you look at maps from the early 20th century, you'll see possibly reference to Sugar Works Company Estate, which was one of the suburban subdivisions there. And it's referring to this sugar works, which was God, there as early as the 1860s, believe it or not. Um, and there's a wharf and there are boats because um, the ingredients for sugar had to be bought in and the product taken away as well. So that's, you can see how heavily forested it is behind. So typically North Sydney, even at, in the 1860s and the seventies, it's the waterfronts that are most developed and the remnant forest is only gradually cleared away by the end of the 19th century. Here's another, oh yes, um, extraordinary, industry that again is is quite obscure. I've only found reference to this by virtue of this illustration, which I then hunted up in the Illustrated Sydney News for the textual description of it. 1872 and a tin smelting works of all things on the bay. And again, the the um, the ore has to be bought in and then the tin taken out by boat because you can see behind that there's a, an escarpment of sandstone. So there's, um, it, it, it's all entirely dependent on the, on the harbour. The harbour is the, the um, means of transport for these tiny little pocket industries on the, on the foreshores. And the biggest of all of them 
established in the late 1870s is the North Shore Gas Company works at Neutral Bay, a huge establishment. You can see the big um, gasometers in the back that rise and fall as the, the gas fills those tanks. Um, that provided the North Shore with gas for lighting um, and later gas for cooking for, well, right up until the 1970s, the North Shore Gas Company became AGL was it was gobbled up by AGL so that date of that photograph is 1902 um but they were there at about that scale from the 1870s and to put that in where are we some type of context there if you can see my cursor that's about where the gas works would be built I think that's right um and in fact, that's where Platypus is today. If you're familiar with North Sydney, um, it did become the, the Platypus submarine um, base. And that's now operated by the Sydney Harbour Federation Trust. Um, yeah, so in here and yeah. Oh no, there it is there. I'm sorry, I was trying to work out where I could see it. There's the gasometers and the North Shore Gas Company. Got that one wrong. And there's their, they were so big that they expanded into Oyster Cove, which is to the west again. Oyster Cove is a section of Ball's Head Bay, which I mentioned earlier. So this is not far from where the Sugar Works Company had their sugar refinery. Um, and this is just as large as that neutral Bay estate. Much of the annoyance of the, the good burgers of what was then Wollstonecraft and Waverton, um, a, the big Wilson Craft Bay Estate had begun to be subdivided and the houses that were being built there, you can see a little vestige of them. These are smaller ones, but a lot of them were quite substantial and um, you know, expensive houses. So it was a middle and upper middle class area. And, and a lot of those people didn't like the idea of a, a gas works down at the end of the end of the road. And they protested that as early as oh, 1914 or thereabouts, but unsuccessfully. And that was there operating till the 1970s or 80s. Now back to Berries Bay, and you can see the Commonwealth oil refinery oil tanks there on the west side of Berries Bay and these uh, boats, boys in an overloaded boat there. That was before that the Anglo-Persian oil depot, and before that it was P&O, leased by Alexander Berry in the 19th century. So that becomes one of the largest um, industrial sites on the North Sydney waterfront. Um, it ends its life as the BP oil refinery um, in the 1990s. You can, yeah, uh, at least 16 tanks, I think, um, possibly more than that. There was at least one disastrous oil spill there. So it affects the quality of the water, needless to say, when you have these large establishments, even boat building, oil leaks, bits of timber float around. Um, all of this affects the, the ecology of these bays. And there's an aerial shot. So you can see how many tanks there are there. So perhaps at least 16. Um, and there's the Shell oil refinery over in Gore Cove, which is still there. Um, the BP site closed up in the late 1990s. I think it had a 99-year lease and it was not deemed um, worthwhile to renew that. Uh, and I'll talk about what happened to that site shortly. And you can see over here, uh, that's the coal loader site. So the coal loader lease in uh, Ball's Head Bay on the western side of Ball's Head. Uh, that lease was signed in 1916 and the coal loader is up and running by 1920. That's what it looks like close up. That wharf is still there in a, in a very bad condition, but has been uh, listed finally, either this year or just last year uh, as a um, state heritage item. So hopefully it will be stabilized and possibly even restored. Um, but you, again, people who know North Sydney will know that you can visit the coal loader, um, the sandstone platform, which is this area here survives, even if the 
the wharf is looking a little perilous. Um, that's all built from sandstone and is a really amazing um, piece of industrial infrastructure to um, explore. You can walk through one of the four tunnels there any time of the day or night still. So that was a major um, coal bunkering depot for coal burning ships, steamers, uh, through the from 1920 through to 1960s, and then it becomes a, a coal export facility through from the mid 70s through to 1992, exporting a particular quality of coal from the Hunter Valley to Japan, which was exactly the type of coal they needed to um, make cement. So it was like a boutique export facility. Berries Bay again, and this is on the eastern side of Berries Bay. John W. Eaton's timber works, just extraordinary. And if you think that this is a um, an exaggeration, it's, it's from an advertisement, a much longer advertisement. This is just a section of that. Have a look at this photograph here, which I only just found this morning and, um, and put into the presentation. An aerial photograph of the site, thanks to Milton Kent, who took some really wonderful aerial photographs of Sydney in the 1930s. Look at the extent of that. There's the single line um, train line that goes around to Lavender Bay and terminates at Milson's Point. And all of this is the timber yard. Goodness me. And several of the um, workers would have been living in these small cottages here. In fact, this area was uh, colloquially referred to as Eatonville because <laughs> it was a, almost like a little village that um, serviced the, the timber yard. So large was it all that timber coming either from Australian forests, but probably even more so from um, the forests of North America. So Douglas fir and all those um, species that filled suburban houses as they were being built on the north side and the expansion of suburban Sydney, particularly suburban North Sydney, the population was booming. When this um, yard was established in the late uh, late 1880s, um, the population was around 17,000 and already by 1914, it's around 40,000. So there's a need for housing and there's a need for timber and that's where it's being bought to and then taken further north. But again, the, the, the water is the means of bringing all that product in. You can see how much of it's stacked there. They also fabricated timber here. So those lovely decorative bits of timber work on the verandas of Federation houses. Some of that was shaped in these in these workshops. Now, just to establish a, um, a basic idea, this is a, a view on the south side. This is um, Darling Harbour here, an imagined uh, bird's eye view of, of Sydney Harbour looking over the city of Sydney. Um, the point being that the, the Western Harbour and here's Darling Harbour, but the equivalent on the north side is Lavender Bay and Berries Bay, is the industrial harbour. And the eastern harbour, what you can see spreading out there, um, is a residential harbour. It's it green um, peninsulas and lovely big houses, essentially. It wasn't industrialised. It was rather accidental. This is a story I've told many times. So you may have heard me say this before. Um, accidental because there were attempts to establish industry and commercial ventures in the east of the harbour. And the most important one for us in North Sydney is the one at Cremorne Point. Um, here is an imagined, uh, an artist's impression rather of the coal mine plan for Cremorne Point uh, in the 1890s that was never realised because um, people said, no, we're not going to have a coal mine there. One of the first times that uh, beauty won over utility. Um, th there was a coal mine opened in Balmain because uh, there was a whole seam of coal under the harbour. People realised that from the 1840s. So it was exploited in the Western Industrial Harbour, but not in the East. Um, and so that th there's um, Arthur Streeton's famous Cremorne pastoral painting. It may still be on display over the Art Gallery in New South Wales. I think it's on permanent exhibition there. Um, so the east, even on the north side, with a couple of exceptions, such as what became the Caraba 
point um ferry depot for the manly the port jackson and manly steamship company but for the most part everything east of neutral bay was um was residential and lovely and green uh and the further you got to the west the more industrial and commercial the waterfront became berries bay again uh curious partner to the well-established quarantine depot at north head which was there from the first half of the 19th century. This is um, a smaller, a much smaller quarantine depot, not where people were housed, but where two launches and a barge were docked and they'd go out and fumigate passenger ships that, that came in, um, fumigating mattresses and, and whatnot. And that was established well around the time of this photograph in 1912. And there's Ball's Head behind, similar landscape to that you saw in that first Woodley's photograph becoming a little bit more depleted um, because the, the forest is being progressively just thinned out as people are felling trees for timber or, or for firewood or whatever but these houses are still there the, these structures are still there um, in Berries Bay and North Sydney Council purchased the site just earlier this year so that's now in public hands right Milson's point very wharf. You saw, you, if you recall that earlier uh, watercolour print of um, of the ferry at uh, at Milson's Point, this is what it became. Um, the North Shore Ferry Company became Sydney Ferry Limited around 1900, and this is the Great Barrel Roof Arcade that was built there. So that's that's the nature of the um, the commuting waterfront, the waterfront that Henry Lawson hated he talked about people hurrying to and from the ferries as they went from their um, houses to their jobs on the south side. He remembered a, a slower, quieter North Sydney in the in the 1890s or early 20th century. And that's the ferry wharf there, to put that in perspective. Where there's a ferry wharf, you need all sorts of other wharfage. You need a depot for coal. And so that whole area there is taken up with as a working waterfront, essentially. And then there's a um, a horse ferry, transport ferry, that goes down what's called Eastern Wharf Road is essentially, well, it's, it, <laughs> that doesn't exist anymore because there's a pile under the bridge there. Um, that was moved over here to Jeffrey Street when the bridge was begun in the 1920s. Even smaller um, ferry depots were substantial structures. You know, the, here the great big turpentine um, piles had to be uh, drilled down many, many feet into the uh, bed of the harbour uh, to build this very substantial wharf in Lavender Bay. And you can see by the end of the 19th century the size of the um the ferries again compared to those the ones you saw in the mid 19th century so this is a really substantial wharf and essentially it exists today this the structure survives i remember wharves very similar to this in the 1960s and 70s in sydney as well so they were very well made and then those were used in fact they're still used today that type of ramp pulled across to climb onto a sydney ferry there's the jeffrey street uh, horse and um, car ferry. Once the bridge is, was underway and, and it's to the right hand side of this photograph, they had to move that Eastern Wharf Road wharf um, a little bit further to the east. You can see the horses sharing that. There's the ferry there and it heads across the Doors Point. And there's another photograph of a passenger ferry and the horse ferry with Kira Billy behind. The foreshores more and more, or well, by the end of the 19th century, many of the foreshores on um, the north side have been extensively modified. So the natural waterfront is basically erased because you've got retaining stone walls and you can see that in Kira Billy as well. Now, the big game changer is the building of the Harbour Bridge, of course, which really um, sinks, if you'll excuse the pun, the, um, the ferry business. Uh, 
because people can get across the harbour by foot, by horse, by tram, by car, by train, as a result of the bridge. Um, as a result of that, Sydney Ferries, again, formerly the North Shore Ferry Company, has a hard time of it and it is acquired by the state government in 1951 and so is essentially um, a private enterprise is taken over and um, become state owned and that's the ferry business that we have today you know it's it's run by the state government runs at a loss uh, still but is regarded as a quintessential part of Sydney and was so in 1951 when they took it over so that those um ferry wharfs and and docking station there at McMahon's point Blues point kicked on until after um the ferries were acquired by the state government <laughs> and I love this photograph looking out of what would be million dollar apartments today and you can see people's sort of washing <laughs> underwear and socks or whatever looking out over there so that's how um matter of fact the waterfronts were in north sydney they were, they were just sort of working waterfronts and the people who worked on the waterfronts live near the waterfronts too very different to today there it is again another view taken around that time that that, that um, previous photograph was taken and look at blues point with this i don't think this is a hulk of a boat to be scrapped but it's not looking in great condition um, and i haven't been able to identify it but this is very scruffy, scrappy waterfront. Eaton's timber yard is just um, to the north of here, sort of in, in Berries Bay. And look what is built on this headland in the next few years. And that's Blues Point Tower, of course, one of Sydney's most famous buildings and certainly North Sydney's most famous building. And that ushers in really um, a new way of thinking about waterfront there, there were plush houses large houses that were taking advantage of views of course um, certainly in the east and also in the west um, in fact you can see some of those large 19th century villas there and they would have been overlooking that ferry wharf there so it's a mixed waterfront but Harry Seidler's idea behind this building and in fact the biggest scheme that he had planned for um McMahon's Point and Blues Point, which was several of these tall towers and many other um, high density blocks too, was to, to create a residential harbour to erase commerce and industry from Sydney Harbour, which was he regarded too beautiful to be despoiled by um, waterfront industry. So he wanted this type of development as much as possible around Sydney Harbour and Glebe and Balmain as well, for that matter. Um, and it really does mark a, a dividing line sort of historical line between uh the the end of the the beginning of the end of the old working waterfront and the beginning of the new high-rise residential waterfront where views are everything um and if you've got a water view these days you can you know add several zeros to the end to the end of your um what you can charge for your property or your apartment now just to remind you there's that Eaton's timber yard photograph and when that timber yard is finally demolished and Eaton's moved to French's forest in uh, the late 1970s that that site is vacant so what are you going to do with it well you can build high rise um, because that's the way of the future in North Sydney as I suggested or you can build parks and North Sydney Council stepped in with the help of the state government and bought the site and turn that into Sawmiller Reserve. And so today it's a little grove of casuarinas and, and other species. And that's important because um, North Sydney was characterized by its working waterfront. And as that industry has vacated, as it has all over Sydney Harbour, Sydney Harbour's barely a working harbour anymore. There's the Shell um, Depot at Gore Cove. There's um, uh, uh docks uh, dock for um, chemical tankers at white bay but there's not much else other than that whereas once roselle oh there's still quite a bit of work going on in roselle bay um boat repairs and things but once upon a time there were oil depots all over the harbor uh, boat repair boat building industries all over the harbor 
timber yards or whatever all over the harbour. And now they've largely gone and you either replace those with housing or you replace them with parks. And North Sydney is blessed because several of those industrial sites have become parkland. Sawmill Reserve is one. And the former BP site, now called Caradar Park, you saw those large tanks, has become another. And that's what it's like from the top. That's the natural rock you need to imagine just off there where this um, walkway is just here is where all those large white tanks were. And this has just created a really beautiful park with interesting spaces to walk along, um, thanks to uh, McGregor and Partners, who are the uh, landscape architects, now Coxall McGregor. And similarly with the boatyards of Berries Bay, um, his Groom Brothers, which was on the site of Ford's Yard, I showed you that plan for Ford's Yard there, Munro Street running down here. That was um, sold up and demolished and redeveloped, sorry, by Stannards, who owned the site in the 1980s or 90s and turned into medium density uh, dwellings. Not unpleasant at all. You can still see the boats here to get out to your to your yacht in Berries Bay. Um, now there's still a vestige of working waterfront in Berries Bay. And I really, <laughs> I really like that as a historian. Noakes Boat Yard have been there for well over 20 years. You can see that establishment there where um, Groom Brothers was and Waddy Ford before that. But they do a lot of uh, boat repairs there. It's a very active waterfront, such an interesting uh, yard to look at and you can do so easily by looking down from the um, BP site, Caradar Park, from the elevated viewing platforms on the western side of the bay. So Noakes hangs on, but it's the last vestige of the working waterfront of North Sydney. And I'll finish with this photograph of Woodley. So there's Woodley still existing. Um, I suspect this dates from the 1940s or 50s, this shed. It's really beautiful and very, very evocative. It's not in great condition. It has been, there's graffiti all over it. But North Sydney Council is negotiating with Transport for New South Wales, who are uh, putting in more transport infrastructure. I think there may be a tunnel going in under there, thereabouts that this will be returned as, as is. It's not going to be demolished um, to North Sydney Council. So redeveloped as public land. Um, but retaining these structures, these structures that once was part of um, North Sydney's extensive working waterfront. That, to my mind, is the most significant uh, boat building structure on Sydney Harbour anywhere, because there's nothing like that exists from that, from that period, from the um, mid to early 20th century. So it'll be great to see that protected and, and stabilised when Transport for New South Wales finally finishes all the work that they're doing. Um, and I'll I'll leave it at that. So there's time for some questions. What are we here? Yeah, we've got 10 minutes for questions. Thanks, Kelly. Thank you very much, Ian. That was fantastic. I'm sure everyone would like to join me in thanking you.